morning, everyone. Now, I thought it's a, vaca it's a long weekend, and I thought you're all going to be out of town. Instead, you're all here, which is really great. Well, welcome to everyone here in our sanctuary, and welcome to everyone watching on Facebook Live. Please know that whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at the First Congregational Church of Sharon, Massachusetts. I wanna, want to make a few announcements uh, that might be helpful to all of you. Uh, Gail Kurtzner is on vacation this week and I will have friendly helpers in the office. Two days will be covered by Jen Trathaway and one on Thursday will be covered by Jamie Schwer. So I get to boss around some other people. <laughs> I think that will be fun. So, uh, but just be patient. Uh, the food pantry, I believe it's all covered. Um, that keeps running and it's busy, still very busy every week as we feed people. And we've just heard news that um, more immigrant families have moved into uh, Sharon and more are coming. So um, all the church communities, the town of Sharon, we are all on alert in terms of finding out what is needed for that time. Um, and uh, so I'll, we'll, we'll let you know if there's anything people can help with, uh, we will let you know. Uh, on October 14th, uh, the admin committee is giving our shed a tender loving care renovation because it looks a little gnawed on, I think. Things have been eating away at it. So we're going to put on new siding. Uh, this is what we think we can do in one day, and then we will have to uh, put a new roof on it too, but all in good time. But that's the work. If you are um, have any free time, want to check it out, come on by to help or to watch or give advice. We will love the advice, actually, <laughs> really. Probably not. Uh, but, so, uh, but it's always a very good time. And then on next Sunday, we have a baptism. The Whitings uh, will uh, have a grandchild of theirs. Uh, baptized, and it's actually, I uh, married Kevin, that was one of my first weddings here, I married Kevin and Brittany, and there is a little Haley that has arrived, and we're going to baptize Haley. This will also be the day we are declaring our Sunday school open again. Oh, I know, I know, it's like our own little field of dreams, if we build it, they will come. Um, so we'll have set up, we'll give this a trial run. I'm always into trial runs. I'm not saying this is forever. Um, we'll take three months and then evaluate if it's, if it's really something we can do, want to do, is needed to be done. So all kinds of things. But uh, if you are interested in teaching a lesson, I found a lovely little program for the next 13 weeks on the Lord's prayer, and, uh, now on the 23rd Psalm, the Lord, Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, you, uh, it's very simple, uh, but I think we do have a responsibility to that next generation. So we'll we'll decide. We have decided at Deacons to give it another try. We have also changed our choir practice. Uh, practice. Um, rather than, you might have read it in our newsletter, rather than having a night out on Tuesdays, we'll put everything together on Sunday. At 9 a.m., we'll practice for the worship service. Then we have worship. Then we get, go for a cup of coffee and a little mingling. But after a little mingling, every one of the choir and anyone else who would like to, to sing is welcome back in the sanctuary and we'll do for another hour to get ready for the next Sunday. So open to all. Maybe this will inspire people if there's 
not another night out, and you always wanted to sing, this is your chance. And I want to draw your attention to the beautiful flowers this uh, day on the altar. They were given by Mike Edson in loving memory of his nephew Cyrus and his friends who died in a horrific car accident. Uh, it was on 95, right? Was it on 95? Yes. So um, it's for remembering Cyrus and Liam and Jamie and Eli and Mary, all who passed, who died uh, in this car accident. So uh, each got a dahlia, and uh, so, you know, they are gone, but they will always live in your hearts and in our hearts. Are there any other announcements at this point in time? If not, then friends, let us join together in our call to worship. We come to this place of worship to encounter the one who has called us here. This Holy One, our God, is with us in every moment. God is in our celebrations and joys. God is in our darkest nights of loneliness. This holy God, our God, blesses us and calls us by name. As night fades before the coming light, we meet the one who saves us, even from ourselves. This God, our God, touches us with the spirit of hope. Our first hymn this morning is number 57, I sing the mighty power of God, let us rise. Please be seated. So let us all join together in our opening prayer. In the darkest moments of our lives, Holy One, we have struggled with you, believing that if we were to defeat you, you would have to give us whatever we want, not realizing you have already blessed us with everything we need in life. 
when our hunger for hope overwhelms us, gracious Christ, you fill us with your presence. When we need for more and more, would pull us further and further away from you, you heal our desires. When we look from those in need, your tears of compassion cleanses our hearts. We would leave our pain behind us and run through your streams of living water, Spirit of God, that we might embrace our sisters and brothers in peace, knowing that our broken relationships have been made whole. God in community, holy in one, we lift our prayers to you. Hear us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our next um, gospel story, scripture reading, in our sermon series, Dinner with Jesus, comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 10 through 17. And actually, the same story, slightly different, is found in all four gospels. And then one of them also had another feeding of the 4,000. So feeding people was, I believe, an important theme in for the early church. So it's unusual that we have the same story close to five times, actually, in the Gospels. But here is Luke's version. On their return, the apostles told Jesus all they had done. Then, taking them along, he slipped quietly into a city called Bethsaida. When the crowds found out about it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed to be cured. The day was drawing to a close, and the twelve came to him and said, send the crowds away so that they may go into the surrounding villages and the countryside to lodge and get provisions. For we are here in a deserted place. But Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. The disciples said, 
we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Now, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, for there were about 5,000 men. I love this. And one commentary writer said, and who knows how many women and children. <laughs> and he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. They did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And all ate and were filled. And what was left was gathered up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Here ends this morning reading. And may God add God's blessing to the hearing and understanding of God's holy word. Alvaro Zess, who used to run a food bank for the poor in Godalco, Spain, got fed up with all the leftovers everywhere around him being thrown away, while at the same time, people in need went dumpster diving for food during the latest economic crisis that hit Spain in the early 2010. Zeitz told NPR, who, by the way, now after this project was done, went to Mongolia to build a hospital. So this guy is actually quite, quite interesting. So he told NPR in an interview that he was intrigued by a scheme in Germany in which people can go online and post notices about extra food and leftovers and others can claim them for free. But Zeitz wanted something more low-tech in his hometown of Godalco, something accessible, accessible to his elderly neighbors who don't use the internet. So he went to the mayor with his idea for a social or solidarity fridge early in 2015. When he came to the city with this idea, I thought it was both crazy and brilliant. How could I say no, said the mayor. We approved a small budget of 5,000 euros right away to pay for the fridge and an initial health safety study as well as electricity and upkeep. And we granted this fridge a special independent legal status so that the city cannot be sued if someone gets sick. But there are rules. No raw meat, eggs, or fish. Homemade food must be labeled with a date and thrown out after four days. But according to volunteers, nothing stays that long in the fridge, ever. Everyone can drop off food, said a volunteer. A number of restaurants drop off their leftover tapas at night, and they are gone by the next morning. We even have grannies who cook especially for this fridge. And after weekend barbecues, you find it stocked with ribs and sausages. Since April 2015, perfectly good food went to hungry people instead of into the dumpsters around town. Something similar happened in Argentina. Once I started researching this, at the same time, refrigerators popped up on sidewalks of a few cities. Inside is food for the hungry and the homeless. In some neighborhoods of Buenos Aires, you might pass a small cafe and see a refrigerator sitting right up against the wall next to the cafe. Over the fridge, a sign reads, take freely only what you need. 
Seriously. People can walk up to that fridge, open the door, take what they need, and walk away. These solidarity fridges or social fridges are a way of showing the poor and the needy that there are, in fact, people who care about them, stand with them, and want to help. Again, the food that is put into these fridges by cafes and restaurant owners, and sometimes by concerned citizens. But putting food in curbside fridges, cafes, are distributing food that otherwise would have been thrown in the trash and wasted, while at the same time, again, helping to feed people in need. So it was interesting, as I did my research and read these articles about community refrigerators, by the way, I thought that was a very exciting kind of thing. I know, it comes with its own problems, but it's a great idea. But the rules are, you go around the world, they're the same. Home-cooked meals must be labeled when they are made, but no eggs, raw meat, or fish. Bread is okay, but no fish. Well, unless you are Jesus. <laughs> then you accept fish and bread, even if the donation isn't very much. In today's gospel story, the donation was five little barley loaves and two little fish. Yet this little faith-filled donation fed thousands. We have heard this story, I believe, a thousand times because, yes, we find it four times in the gospel and each is a little different, but the gist is the same. Jesus has been teaching people and curing bodies in the countryside. A huge crowd has gathered to hear Jesus and to get help, and the afternoon slips by. Evening descends, and by now, the people should have left in order to find food for dinner. But now, they kept hanging on, and the disciples got worried. They were in the middle of nowhere, a deserted place with no access to any food source, let alone that could feed 5,000 men and the entourage, making it closely to probably 10,000 people. The disciples, always practical and overly rational, were rightfully worried as the day was drawing to a close, the 12 came to Jesus and said, send the crowds away so that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside to lodge and get provisions, which by in and of itself would have been a big problem. But we are here in a deserted place. And Jesus did not say, yes, you are right, send the crowds away. He said to them, you give them something to eat. And back comes what I think is a little bit of a snippy reply. We have no more than five loaves and two fish. If you, um, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, which we know by now would have been an absolutely impossible task, financially and practically. In the training manual, this has something to do with the sermon, actually. In the training manual for the Ritz-Carlton hotel employees, there is a maxim that says, if you see a problem, you own it. To say, it's not my problem or it's not my job is not acceptable, is not an option. If you see a problem, you own it you take responsibility. Now, yes, Jesus doesn't do the re reasonable thing here, the rational thing, but turns this problem into an opportunity, a teachable moment. You give them something to eat. 
the disciples think practically as they do the math and know that they don't have the resources to do the job. Their own food supply is pretty meager, just five loaves and two fish, which basically amounts to practically nothing in the face of this huge crowd. They've crunched the numbers, added up the logistical formula, and it just doesn't jive. But Jesus seeks to teach them a different kind of math based not on addition, but on multiplication. So what's going on here? What's the lesson? The disciples are thinking scarcity, and Jesus is thinking abundance. Don't tell me what you don't have. Show me what you do have. Bring them here to me, Jesus says, who looks at a meal of meager provisions. And as the people are seated, Jesus took five loaves and two fish. He looked up to heaven and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples to set before the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and what was left was gathered up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Now, I'll be honest with you, many people believe that the story of feeding of the 10,000 men, women, and children is about miracles. But I don't think so. At least it's not for me. It is so much more. And it all has to do with who Jesus is and what he represents. At the end of the story, they gather in the leftovers, 12 baskets. It sort of makes the point that when Jesus, God's child, is involved, all we get is only abundance, not scarcity. With Jesus, we will never run out of hope or love, forgiveness, compassion, mercy, or kindness. That is what I believe the story is really about. And the connection, of course, to the Lord's Supper in our story is pretty obvious. Jesus asked the disciples to organize the crowd into groups of 50. I'm not quite sure what that is all about. But then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, the meal was there for everyone. Everyone was welcome. Now, the story in John has a little different of an incident. See, Jesus will say on the very next day to the very same people that followed him around to be fed alive, he said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. This is a scene that really only comes into focus after we see Jesus lifted up on the cross, after we watch as he distributes the bread to his disciples in the upper room and says, take and eat, this is my body given for you. It was sort of a lesson that he hoped the crowds would understand when he distributed the five loaves and two fish. He hoped that they would catch a glimpse of the divine and that they might believe in him and the one who sent him. But they don't. The crowds didn't. Jesus was no fool. He knew what was going on. When he saw the same people the next day, he knew why they had once followed him. He said, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me because you ate your fill yesterday of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of God will give you. Jesus' communal distribution of the loaves was supposed to remind them 
of Moses who had fed the Israelites with manna in the wilderness. They were supposed to see the greater than Moses now among them, and they were supposed to believe in him who, whom God had sent. Again, they don't. And therein, I believe, lies the tragedy of some experiences we have with Jesus. We don't see him. We don't recognize who he is and what he wants to accomplish and what he wants us to accomplish. In this little encounter, we learn a lot about Jesus. Apparently, he is trying to get away from the crowds. He needs a little downtime and understood the importance of rest as he tried to get away. But he also has a strategy of dealing with crowds. He has clear pri priorities. He was not driven by the expectations of others. He always made time for individuals. He delegated, gave the bread and fish to others to distribute, and he had a trusted cycle of colleagues to help him with the work. These are some moments of the, some of the things we see in this Eucharistic moment in the countryside, as Jesus gives himself to the crowd, teaches his disciples by way of example and putting aside his personal needs, has compassion and gives himself to the people abundantly. I started the sermon with telling you about Alvaro Zeitz and his solidarity fridge, an idea that came out of a known overabundance of food and a true need for people to be fed. He connected the two, and so in some ways he made it his problem and his town's problem. This idea caught on, so I wondered if there are community fridges, refrigerators in the United States. They do, actually, they're all around us, and I had no idea. You can find them in Cambridge, South Boston, in Hyde Park, Quincy. Worcester actually has a organization called Woofridge, and they help people establish these community fridges. They are in Lynn and Malden, in many more communities. And indeed, many of them started during the pandemic to feed the hungry and the homeless. And at the same time, reduce food waste, which by the way is another issue for another sermon because we alone in this country throw away 40% of our food production, 40%. Oh, that's crazy. Anyways, another sermon at another time. So I have to tell you, I am proud of this church and our food pantry. Actually, right now, if you go to the library, it is stocked with bread. Bread that Shaw's and Stop and Shop will throw away unless somebody picks it up. We pick it up for our food pantry. It takes, yes, many volunteers, and many of them are in here, and the leadership of Gail Kurtzner to make our food pantry hop Monday through Thursday. Most of our food is donated, some of it we buy, but the rescued food is perfectly good food that would normally end up in dumpsters. We might not feed 10,000 people at a time. I think I'm looking at Carol and she said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> but I bet by now we have provided a few thousand meals to hungry families since we reopened during the pandemic. So here's the thing, as followers of Jesus, we are called to make it, 
to make the problems of the world our problems. And yes, I know that seems like an impossible task. But like we already did, we can when we have the will and the faith and the people to make a small difference in our little corner of this world. Amen.
as we begin our time of prayer to share the concerns and the joys within our midst, I encourage you to take a look at our list and keep those people in your hearts as you go about your week. Uh, I've uh, gotten a request to offer prayers and for all of us to offer prayer for Ed Williamson, who is in hospital with health concerns. And of course, we'll keep our eyes on the situation in Israel um, as there is now another war going on in our midst. But we pray for the families, for the lost life, for the injured, for the destruction. Um, it is, it's tragic. Are there any other concerns at this point anyone would like to share? Yes, Kathy. I would ask for prayers for my dear friend Don Bryant, who started with melanoma and it's now progressed to stage four lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And it makes me want to read the book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. Yeah. Thank you, Don Bryant. Anybody else? Then let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, for you have loved the world into being, formed it with a word, enlivened it with your breath, and cared for it with your life. We give thanks for your faithfulness upholding your promise even when we fail. As you created in love, so you call in love again and again, bringing us together and making us your body. When we lost our way or turned away, you still sought us. Through the voices of your prophets, you showed us your vision and offered us your hand. Though we do not often show it well, we are grateful, O oh God. We give you thanks for Christ who came to walk among us, living our life and dying our death, teaching and eating and healing, drawing us close to you, feeding us with your word and your presence and showing us the extent of your love. Though we did not recognize you in our midst, our hearts full of our own ways and gods of our own making, you stretched out your arms and gave us your last breath. And then in the shadow of that very morning, you broke the last barrier, bringing life yet again into our world providing love and proving that love always has the last word. It is still hard to see you, O oh God, in our world today. Love is elusive, healing seems far off, and peace an impossible dream. And so we pray, O oh God, that just as you fed the multitudes, you would once again make your abundance among us known. Where your children go hungry, break us open like bread. Where your people are thirsty, pour us out in streams of clean and living water. Where the earth groans, let your dew refresh and your shade protect. You promised a flourishing and abundant life, and we beg you to continue your promise, O oh God. 
make your reality seen among us once again and even now. May your Holy Spirit open our eyes and ears, our hearts and minds to know you and your call and to serve you with every breath. Give us courage to be makers of peace and doers of justice. Courage to confess our own shortcomings without highlighting the sins of others. Courage to trust your word of hope in a world of fear. We pray these and all things in the name of Christ, whose healing spirit is available to all and whose love can nourish every heart. And as he taught us to pray whenever we are gathered, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The God who is mindful of us and our needs sends us into the world to attend to the needs of others. Where there is enmity or suffering or spiritual poverty, may we become channels through which the Holy Spirit can act. In the sense of having generously received, may we give thankfully and generously as well. Will you join me in prayer? With great joy, we present these tithes, gifts of time and talent, and the gift of our very selves for your mission in the world through the ministries of this church. Be with each of us as we commit ourselves to lives of joyful, thankful service. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 353, called as Partners in Christ's Service.
Please be seated. Friends, the Spirit of God sends us forth to serve. So go in peace, knowing that God will always be by your side in all that you do. Go in love, offering healing and hope to others. And go in joy, that others may be lifted and inspired in service. Go in peace. Amen.